Thank you, Johannes, for the introduction. Thank you all for coming to listen to me talk about one of my favorite subjects, chimpanzee conservation. No thanks to Ian for the sly digs on the side, but <laughs> only, one. only one. Okay. Okay, so uh, 50,000 years ago, a, a, blink of a, a blink of the eye in terms of the time scale some of my colleagues here at the Institute of Human Origins deal with. We were not alone. We shared the earth with several very close primate cousins, including the Neanderthals and Denisovans, who we shared a last common ancestor with, the ancient DNA data suggests, as recently as about 700,000 years ago. Some other interesting creatures too, like these hobbit-like creatures, Homo floresiensis and Homo luzonensis. Those would have been interesting creatures to, to meet, to get to, maybe even to get to study them, using long-term data perhaps. But unfortunately, they're all gone. Gone. <laughs> this one you know is gone, because we, we only have like this picture of a bone, right? <laughs> gone. Now, this is controversial, but I think most paleoanthropologists would agree that our own species, anatomically modern Homo sapiens, had something to do with these extinction events of our close hominin relatives. Now scientists debate you know, how much Homo was involved and what the particular root was. Was it something really direct, like directly killing them? Were we just you know, competing for the same resources? We were better at turning those resources into survival and more offspring? Was it something even more indirect, just passive introduction of novel diseases to which these guys had no genetic immunity because they didn't evolve alongside the same set of pathogens? Well, all we've got left today in terms of close living relatives are these two species in the genus Pan, bonobos and chimpanzees. We last share an ancestor with these guys, genetic data suggests, about 7 million years ago. So 10 times as distant as our closest you know, extinct relatives than Neanderthals and Denisovans. Unfortunately, our closest living relatives are on the same path to extinction as our closest already extinct relatives. So here's data I pulled up today from the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, the official sort of uh, body to, to give the status of different species. And both chimps and bonobos are classified as endangered. That means their populations are declining. And if they continue at the rate of decline that they're experiencing now, they'll be in extinct within 50, 75 years. Now take these numbers with a grain of salt. Uh, chimpanzees and bonobos are difficult to count. But there's a few hundred thousand chimps, uh, which actually have the widest distribution of great apes. They're found across uh, equatorial Africa. As recently as 40 years ago, that would have been uh, between that western cluster and eastern cluster would have been much more filled in, but they've been wiped out from many of the countries. Most of today's living chimp chimpanzees uh, live in uh, just north of the Congo uh, River, and all the bonobos, some 15 to 20,000 of them, live uh, just south of the Congo River, which is Congo River probably important in why we've got two species leading to their geographical separation and subsequent speciation. So let's go back to these Homo sapiens related extinction causes of the Neanderthals, the Denisovans, these hobbit-like uh, creatures. Unfortunately, they're the same. They have some striking similarities with the major causes of uh, the, the drastic decline in chimpanzee and bonobo populations. Poaching is a major cause, probably the major cause uh, of population uh, decline. Habitat destruction, lots, large parts of Africa being cleared for agriculture and a lot of logging going on, a lot of mining going on 
that is taking up the, you know, the habitats that chimpanzees and bonobos need to survive. And uh, human diseases, novel diseases to, to uh, chimps and bonobos to which they've got no developmentally acquired or genetically acquired immunity can have really big effects on chimp and bonobo populations. So I've been studying uh, the Ngogo chimpanzees, who are this habituated group of chimpanzees in the center of uh, Kibali National Park, which is located in southwestern Uganda, in East Africa, um, not too far away, where Ian has been studying those uh, Gombe chimpanzees in Tanzania. Uh, Kibali National Park is an important, thought to be an important chimp population. It contains the East African subspecies of chimps. There's four subspecies of chimps. This is one of them, the long-haired uh, chimpanzee. Um, they're an IUCN priority population, which means that it's one of 16 populations that if we save all of these 16 populations, we'll save 96% of the remaining uh, population of this East African subspecies. So in, research has been going on at Ngogo since 1995, but as is a typical story for a lot of primatologists, you start out doing research, as the years go by, you do more conservation. That's, it's, a, it's a story that is old as the story of primatology. It happened with Jane Goodall. It's happened with us. The main threat to chimpanzees in Kibali National Park is hunting by the local population of Homo sapiens. So we're actually pretty lucky in Kibali that the local people have taboos against eating primates. But what they do is they set these snares for uh, little creatures like this blue diker here, a little type of forest antelope, for bush pigs, for things like buffalo, even elephants can get caught in snares. Um, as shown here, here's some, some camera traps we've got set up. There's a, an elephant who's, who's got his trunk in a snare, golden cat. You can't really see, can't really see it too well, but this, this elephant on the right here actually has a snare that's around its trunk, and then it's sort of hooked under its leg. So it's like yanking its own trunk uh, when, it, when it moves its legs. Chimps also get caught in these snares. So here's an old female Lita. She's still alive. She's about 56 years old. Uh, Tom Strusaker, who was instrumental in starting in making Kibali a national park, he worked there before the Ngogo Chimp Project. He's one of the few chimps that She's one of the few chimps that, that, Tom know, that Tom knew. She had a snare way back then. So she's been living with this, with this missing foot for over 40 years. Uh, on the right, we've got uh, Richmond, uh, former alpha male of, of one of our two groups of chimpanzees. He's, he's here doing his best at performing a hand clasp groom, one of these famous chimpanzee behaviors. They go like this and groom under each other's armpits. Very interesting because only some chimp communities do it, others don't. So it's been suggested to be sort of incipient culture in a non-human primate. He's doing his best, but as you can see there, he, he's got no hand. So snaring is a major problem. How much does it affect mortality? It's hard to really estimate. You know, a lot of chimps got snare injuries, but how many are dying from it? Ian mentioned the chimps have got fish infusion social systems. So what happens is just, oh, we haven't seen this chimp for a week, for two weeks, for, for a month, for, for three months. Okay, I guess they must be dead. We usually don't know why. But we do know that there is, despite the taboo against uh, eating primates, there is hunting of chimpanzees in Kibali National Park. Um, we've had a few uh, cases over the years of meeting poachers with, with hunting dogs. Uh, chimps end up dead. The local people tell us that, yeah, they don't eat the chimps themselves, but they feed them to their hunting dogs. Look how skinny they are, you know? You could, you could see why they would do that. So to combat this uh, threat of, of hunting of the, of the chimps, we started in 2011 with one anti-poaching team. 
comprised of local Ugandans, some of whom are ex-poachers, to patrol the forest looking for snares. They started just by patrolling around uh, Ngogo. They work with local Uganda Wildlife Authority rangers who've got the, the mandate um, and the firepower to actually deal with poachers and, and arrest them, as well as uh, protecting our poaching team. But they don't, they don't really have the, as good as you know, the ex-poachers that we're hiring of, of how to find snares, how, how to track po poachers. So it's, it's a good collaboration we have with UA. And now we've got eight teams patrolling inside the park. Um, I just wanted to point out, we've got a paper uh, in review with uh, John Mitani. Uh, we're just doing a very simple question. Does, does, do these anti-poaching patrols work? And you know, it's, it's going to be a series of papers, but the first one is very simple. Just comparing uh, individual um, rate per year of snare injuries in the about 12 years before we started the anti-poaching program. To, to those, those individual you know, chance per year during the, you know, when we actually got the patrolling going on. And it's a 93% reduction in snare injuries among the Ngogo chimpanzees. So it works at least at this local level. But of course, most of the chimpanzees in Kibali National Park are not habituated living at a, a research center um, with the protection that that, that that, that that involves. So our patrol teams, just in the last year, just to give you an idea of, of what they're doing, uh, they work two six-day shifts per month where they're camping out in the forest so they can try to reach all the areas. Last year, um, they patrolled over 32,000 uh, kilometers, unfortunately. So at, at, you know, as we've gotten more funding over the years, We've tried to increase the number of the snare teams, and our eventual goal is to get complete coverage of the park. But we're not, as you can clearly see from this figure, there's large parts of Kibali that aren't, you know, visited by our patrol teams in a given year. So we've got to um, keep expanding. So during this same period, they removed 469 snares and traps, destroyed 69 poacher camps, and the UA Wildlife Authority, Uganda Wildlife Authority rangers who were accompanying them made 31 arrests of poachers. Usually, you know, they, they lay ambushes when they, when they think poachers are in the, in the area. But over this last year, a lot of uh, these arrests had to do with illegal logging. So I told you, we've expanded the number of poaching teams over the years. It's been a consistent pattern that each time we set up a new team working in a new area, we come across actually quite large amounts of illegal large-scale logging. You know, and this is Kibali National Park. It's supposed to be one of the most protected uh, parks in Africa, but this is going on sort of under our noses. On the left is a tobacco pl plantation inside Kibali National Park. They also do like you know, pit sawing, which is shown here on the right, mainly for hardwoods that they use to make tools. Okay, so just a little sidebar here. You, you know, all this anti-poaching work, it's effective. It's effective for the chimpanzees, but what, lo what impact does it have on the local human population, right? That's something we have to consider as well. Now, how poaching works is different in every part of Africa, but how it works in Kibali National Park is that bush meat, like in, in some parts of, of uh, chimp range, the people rely on bush meat because it's the only source of protein, right? They need it. It's not the case so much in Kibali. Bush meat, there's actually costs more than domestic animals. It's sort of a luxury good that only the richest local people can afford. The poachers generally aren't eating their own meat because they can't afford it. So in cooperation with uh, an NGO, uh, we got this grant from the Arcus Foundation that's been running for the last three years. And this NGO specializes in poverty alleviation through economic uh, development via microloans and business training of actual businesses that are likely uh, to, to work in the local population. 
So we started this program with them. We started it off uh, in an area where we strongly suspected most of the poachers were coming from. It's an area that doesn't enjoy a lot of economic benefits uh, because of its isolation. You know, they're not getting tourist dollars. They're not getting, you know, all this humanitarian involvement from NGOs because they're way, way, way the heck up there. So through, through this grant, we've put, you know, thousands of dollars uh, into the local uh, community. And we, we, hope that it, we hope that it's working. It's, it's a hard thing to evaluate the actual impact, but at least it has a humanitarian impact, if not a conservation impact. Uh, we've just been invited by Arcus Foundation to resubmit this uh, program to go on for another three years. But we're going to shift it to a new location. And that uh, brings me uh, to sort of the next topic I want to talk about. I'll, I'll come back to that, to this new location. So that's uh, ecotourism of chimpanzees. So ecotourism, you can spend now, the rate is about $150. You can go to Kibali National Park and visit this Kanyanchu group of chimpanzees, which is directly to the south of Ngogo. Spend an hour watching uh, the chimpanzees. Here you can see in this photo there's about a dozen tourists and, and up there in a tree is a chimp. So this is a, this chimp ecotourism is a major part of uh, the Ugandan economy. 8% of which, 8% of the GDP of Uganda is tourist dollars. This chimp tracking is a big part of it. Thousands of tourists a year, millions of dollars coming into Kibali National Park. 20% of that revenue goes to the local people surrounding the park. Sounds great, right? Well, it is great, but it comes from problems. So to meet this growing demand, and you know, it's a lot of money, Ua wanted to habituate another group for tourism so they could make more money. Habituating chimps is hard. It, it took them about 10 years. And at the end of these 10 years, they're finally habituated, but then the Ua learns that they actually ended up habituating a group of chimpanzees that borders the edge of the park. Now the local people there, the local farmers bordering the edge of the park, have always put up with low-level crop rating by animals. It's, it's a fact of life. You deal with it. It's OK. It's not major. Now you've got a group of 50 chimps who are habituated, who've lost their fear of humans. They'd post up in these fields 50 chimps for three weeks and eat three acres of sugar cane. You could understand how this might lead to some human-wildlife conflict and conflict between the local people and, and the park. Uh, so what did we do? Well, what we did to try to help solve this prob problem is in cooperation with UWA, there are 28 families who are being really strongly affected by this crop rating. We hired four people, two teams, from these families of the most affected farmers to do something simple. When a chimp shows, when a chimp or a group of chimps shows up in a farm, they get on the WhatsApp network, call our guys in, and they just come, yell at the chimps, throw ro throw not rocks, we're not throwing rocks. Throw <laughs> edit that out. <laughs> Throwing clods of dirt that would never actually hurt the chimpanzees, but would serve the function of scaring them back into the park. So how these chimps get out of the park into the community is they use these sort of swamps that have these riverine you know, forests on them, these nice little highways that come out of the park into the local community. Well, we know where they come out. And if you hear chimps the night before nesting in the park next to one of these entrances to... I mean, one of these exits out of the park to come to the local community. Our guys will post up there the next morning like this and like, no, you, you shall not pass. And it's been a rather successful program. You know, in one year of operation, we, do, we reduce the crop rating to almost nothing. There's just one old guy who will not give up that sugar cane life. Also, um, another thing we did related to this problem is we habituated another group that Ua can bring tourists to. And this group is, it's, 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 it doesn't border the edge of the park. So it's, it's a group that's going to lead to less human uh, chimp 
conflict. Okay, going back to that um, alleviating, alleviating poverty and that, that um, Arcus grant. We've also, our plan is, if it's funded, we're going to move this, this poverty alleviation business loan thing, we're going to move it to the, this area outside of the park where the people are just, were suffering for many years from these habituated crop rating chimpanzees. Okay. Uh, another problem with tourism and, and research, really any sort of situation where you've got close contact between ch habituated chimpanzees and you can get close to them is, like I alluded to at the start, disease transmission. So I love this photo. You know, it's one of my favorite chimps here. DJ Django on the right, and, and one of my favorite people, my wife Carol, on the left. She looks good in this picture, but I hesitate to show it. Does anyone know why? Okay, the chimp people know, some other people know. She's got no face mask on. This is, this is disease transmission, you know, this is, it's not just COVID, you know. It's, um, it's a big deal, you know. So, in 2017, January 27, January 2017, a respiratory virus, which we later, you know, identified as uh, uh, I, I, MPV. I can never pronounce it. It's a respiratory virus that, through genetic analyses, our collaborators showed had li highly likely origins in humans, swept through the Ngogo population, killing 25 individuals in one month. 12.5% of the Ngogo chimpanzees died with a disease that probably originated in us researchers. So that's why uh, we got serious about our disease, uh, our, our procedures, wearing face masks, really being serious about maintaining the 7 to 10 meter distance, frequent hand sanitization, eventually even a quarantine camp where you have to spend a week in before you can come uh, and, st and actually study in go-go chimps to try to prevent these things in uh, the future. Related to this, we want to improve uh, tourists and, and the UA guides who take the tourists to see the chimps, we want to improve their behavior as well to reduce disease transmission. You know, it's, it's simple stuff, but, but it's an incentive problem, right? The, the guides, oh, let me give you this, oh, come, you know, like there's all these incentives to give the tourists a special experience, and that can result in breaking rules. So uh, in a project led by Christina Gomez, Gomez um, and, uh, Gladys Kalima Zikusoka, who's a, a Ugandan wildlife veterinarian and, and well-known conservationist, were uh, recently got funded by Arcus to, to work together with the Uganda Wildlife Authority to really see what we can do to reduce disease transmission. We actually approached Arcus about just focusing on Kibali, and they're like, no, we'll give you more money. We want you to do this in all of Uganda. But we're going to start in Kibali with this program. So I've given you a very sort of Ngogo Kibali specific, uh, specific picture of chimpanzees and the conservation challenges they face. While it's true that hunting, uh, habitat loss, and dis disease transmission are the big three for all chimp chimps and bonobos, how that plays out can vary dramatically across their range. This is a good recent review and opinion paper uh, covering all of these issues if you want to learn about this in greater detail. So all of this work is not possible without the collaboration of, of many other uh, you know, professors and students like myself, but especially our, our Ugandan collaborators, and I'd just like to single out three of them here. Uh, Sam Angadekin, who's been our field director since 2012 and is now almost finishing up his PhD dealing with um, 
actually on poaching at Makerere University in, Kam in Kampala, Uganda. Salma, who worked on me with a lot of these uh, conservation issues and, and habituation. And our recently re retired Big James Tibisimwa, who's trained, who started the first anti-poaching team and has, has trained all of our other seven teams over the years. And thanks to all of uh, our various funding agencies. If you want to learn more about research and conservation at Ngogo, check out our website. Uh, also, opportunities to support what we're doing, if you think any of this is worthwhile. Or if you just want to buy a nice shirt, another <laughs> indirect way to support what we're doing in Kibale. And finally, it was Two years ago that uh, my graduate student, Sebastian, <clears throat> died at Ngogo, we've set up a scholarship to uh, um, administer through International Primatological Society for, for people like Seb who came from developing countries who, who want to do primate research and conservation. All right. Thank you, guys.